Hello, my name is Victoria and today I'm going to present you the Punnett Squares. This is a continuation of yesterday's video, which was about the basics and introduction of genetics. So if you haven't seen that yet, maybe that's a point to start with. Uh, I hope you're going to learn something and let's start with the video. First of all, what is a Punnett Square? It is a chart which is used to predict or to represent the outcome of the crossing of two individuals. Where is it used? It's used in animal and in plant breeding, so for example in dog kennels and also in medicine. Let's just make an example for that. So if there's for example a couple who has the wish to have a child, but both are carriers for autosomal recessive disease, like for example, cystic fibrosis or Marfan syndrome, in which the disease is um, within the recessive allele, then in a Punnett square can be represented how likely it is that one or more of their children will have the disease, will be carriers for the disease, or that they will be healthy. So as you can see here, I drew a Punnett square. Um, how exactly it works, I will explain later. Let's just say here on the top part of the chart is the mother's genotype with a dominant and recessive allele. And then um, on the vertical line on the left is the father's genotype, also with a dominant and a recessive. So both are carriers because they have one recessive but they also have one dominant, so they're carrying the disease, but they're not expressing it. For that, they would need two recessive alleles. And then we cross both their alleles with each other. And the four squares, which I marked here, are um, their possible offspring. And here we can see that in the first upper left section, uh, we can see an offspring with two dominant alleles. And even though it might be easy to think, okay, both capital letters, that stands for what we're searching for, this is not the sick child. That's why I crossed it through. It's the healthy child. It's the one which has two dominant alleles, but the disease is autosomal recessive. So this child is healthy. And the child on the bottom right uh, has two recessive alleles. So that's the one that expresses the disease. And the other two with a dominant and recessive, so a heterozygous uh, genotype, those are carriers of the disease, but they do not express it. Okay, another example. If one parent has an autosomal recessive disease and also has symptoms for it, so has a homozygotic recessive genotype, and the other parent um, is healthy, so has a dominant. Um, homozygotic genotype. Then we see here that all the children will be carriers because they will get one um, recessive allele from one parent, the one who has the disease, and one dominant allele, so the healthy allele, from the other parent. And remember, two recessive alleles are needed for the disease to be expressed when it's recessive. And what are the requirements? When can we use a Punnett square? So there are three requirements that are needed to be given that we can use this method to predict or represent um, the outcome of the crossing of two individuals. The first one is that each trait is determined by a single locus. Remember in the last video about the basics of genetics, I explained a locus is a place on a given chromosome. Then the next requirement is that the traits are inherited independently from each other. And also very important is that we have to have the knowledge about the genotype of the P generation. So we have to know uh, whether they are heterozygotic or homozygotic, dominant or recessive. Then there are different types for Punnett squares, but which one are they? You can see them now on the screen. We have a monohybrid and a dehybrid, which is usually used. Um, here on this paper, I only used monohybrid ones, 
so for one trait where we cross um, two parts of the p generation with each other and get four boxes. As you can see in the line below, in a D hybrid one, we compare two traits with each other. Like uh, again in the last video, which I posted yesterday about the introduction, um, there we had a panel square where it was about blonde and brown hair, straight hair and curly hair, all in one panel square. This is the same example now again, uh, where we have 16 boxes and just compare on a larger scale. For three or more traits, a panel square is usually not used because it would be a little bit too chaotic and not as clear. So there are other methods how to predict or represent uh, these traits there. Uh, now we come to the question of how can I create a panel square? So first of all, you I usually make a mark on what is the genotype of the P generation. And then uh, you can put one part of the parent generation on the horizontal top line of the chart and the other one on the vertical left line so that they build the outer border of the chart. And the uh, individual gametes are divided uh, by a line so that they can create each a single box for the chart. Remember, in the monohybrid one, we will end up with four boxes. In the dehybrid one, with 16 boxes. And then when we divided the um, P generation on the outer lines, then we start to cross them. We use the most left one of the horizontal line of the parents, which is here a small a. And then we cross it with the first one of the vertical line, which is here a capital A. And then we write them together in the first box. And uh, remember here that always the dominant allele, so the capital letter, is written first. So here we write capital A and then small a. So here we have a heterozygotic genotype. And then in the one below, we cross again the small a, so the first gamete of the here red parent generation, and cross it with the second one of the blue part of the parent generation. And here we get a homozygotic recessive genotype. Uh, I've written down everything here on the right side of the chart so you can revise it again. I think the rules for this should be clear now. And what does a panel square exactly show? Or what does it not show? It does not show how many offsprings a P generation will uh, generate or will have. But what it shows is how likely it is that when a P generation gives us one offspring, that it will have or have not a certain trait. Like for example, in the example we had before with the parents with the autosomal recessive disease, uh, when both were carriers, then we had a um, probability of 25% that a child will suffer from the disease, 25% that uh, children will be healthy, and 50% of the children are carriers. This can be represented and uh, seen depending on if the offspring is homozygotic or heterozygotic for a certain trait and if they are dominant or recessive. Uh, remember, uh, one dominant allele makes automatic uh, dominant phenotype and two homozygotic recessive are needed to express the recessive trait phenotypically. So that's it for today's video. I hope you learned something and if you liked my video I would be very happy if you could subscribe and uh, with that support me to continue with my videos.